everybody, um, or rather welcome to our webinar on Julie. I recognize the names around the table this afternoon. Many of you are obviously ZP engineers and we do have a guest as well. We do this really because um, we want to show commitment to our products and services. Um, and Julie is kind of central to what we do. So I'm going to jump in and do a sort of quick um, overlook on Julie. And then we have some engineers um, in the room as well who will talk about um, various aspects um, of Julie. Quick introduction for me, I'll try to be quick. A quick um, analysis of cyclovoltammetry, which I think is um, maybe is coming from, um, in fact, um, will come from one of the engineers. I know Tatiana is going to probably do EIS. Um, we are going to deal with um, glucose data, which will come from Lynn, but you could also think that this is lactate data, or oxygen data, or any many enzymatic datas. If I could say that, um, we will. I'll talk a little bit about. Um, we use the cycle of voltammetry quite a lot, or the Judy quite a lot in our manufacturing. So I will touch upon that. Um, and also, we we'll, we do use um, Judy quite a bit in our impedance spectroscopy data. So I will describe that. Um, and I also then we'll finish with a sort of slightly different um, thing, if I can put it that way, which is um, sense it all, um, which is a technology platform from ZP. So anyway, let me go a bit quicker. So we're going to have various people speaking at various points along today or along this afternoon. Just a quick introduction. We were um, ZP was launched in 2014. At the heart of what we do is Julie. Julie is really a repository um, for electrochemical data um, where we store, analyze, share our electrochemical data. We are ISO 13485. We do a lot of contract development of I would say here electrochemical biosensors, though we are actually now also doing spectrochemical biosensors, and we'll touch upon that. The team is fairly large and located um, in some state-of-the-art facilities, both in Norway and in the UK. And in the UK, we do have um, two facilities, a small one in Swansea and a, and a slightly larger one in Coventry. The um, focus of this afternoon is actually um, Julie. Julie is something that really started with ZP for almost from day one. I mean, we were, we were asking the question, what are we going to do with all this data that we think we're going to generate? You know, and that, so going into the, into ZP and going into you know the building of ZP, we always knew that data was going to have to be at the heart of what we were doing. Several of us have had long careers where you're asking the questions, you know, where's the data? And that's a, you know, in some startups, that is a problem. Um, where is the data? Simply people don't know. Then people don't know how to visualize the data. They're either using the software that gathers the data or they're using Excel or something else. But, you know, we wanted to be able to sort of store it and visualize it. Processing the data. I think a, sometimes a mistake that happens is that people use software to gather the data and to process the data. I think these are two different platforms, you know, that vendors overburden their software and say, oh, this is my, for example, in my world, potential stat data. Oh, sorry, my potential stat software. Well, it shouldn't really be processing the data. I mean, that really should be done by data scientists these days. So we um, don't process the data through the data collection system. The data collection system is a conduit for data, and we process the data through Julie. I'll talk about data acquisition today. The data acquisition that we'll talk about today um, is a little bit like this, that um, we have something called Sense It All, it will gather data, the data will immediately go to the cloud and we can um, share that on by um, API, Application Program Interface. The stimulation for, for being what we describe as a sort of sample to API company is that if you look at the top Fortune 500 companies, they all have an API strategy. And so we really have put API or Application Program Interface at the heart of ZP um, so that we can plug into these large companies and be part of this kind of global economy. Um, Julie really helps with a network effect. Uh, what that means is that a person gathering the data, in fact, we just had this just a minute ago that um, we've been in the lab, we've been gathering some data by voltammetry and impedance spectroscopy. Um, the scientists who collected the data, the data scientist and myself just met online. And because it was all in Julie, we were able to see it really quickly. And it's a kind of a common tool, you know, everyone knows how it works. So that it was really scalable and I almost call that like a network effect. Um, you can get Julie for free, um, but there's a, there are differences between freemium and premium. Freemium is basically intended just to say, here you are, get your free account, um, try out the tools, you know, the tools are kind of unlimited. 
you can do things like export reports but then when you start getting to some of the features like templates a template is a way of setting up Judy so that when the data comes in it'll process the data in a way that you've already decided upon and display it in a way that you've already decided upon so that's really scaling yourself so you know the CTO the CSO should have a vision of how they want their data to be processed and how they want their data to be saved don't leave it to the individual scientists and Julie has the template ability so you can actually then run templates it works with amperometry and it works with potentiometry it's also quite generic as well so for example um, if your data stream is absorption versus wave number or sorry I should say wavelength wave number is also relevant as well but if often data is actually two columns of data you've got like a sort of a a variable of a parameter and something that varies as a function of that parameter Julie doesn't really care whether it's electrochemical data or not but so the term generic just means that we can actually upload all sorts of um, rows and columns of data Julie is a place to store raw data you can also download it and sort of do some python um, um, manipulation upon it as well you can analyze the reports you can delete reports if you've got the premium account the thing about the freemium account is you soon fill it up fill it up i will go a little bit faster you can make projects you can make edits when you've got the premium version you can make clusters and you can make comparative reports comparative reports are useful um I, we use comparison quite a bit at zp we make a really good um screen print electrodes and we do comparisons to make that sure that batch to batch is good so an individual report may have a batch from a particular batch but then we'll watch the process over time and make sure that we're not sort of drifting in a upwards or downwards direction um, or have, you know, you from doing batch to batch, you may, if you did batch to batch over 12 months, you may even find that you've got a seasonal influence. So uh, Julie answers the question, where's my data? Here's our scientists in the lab. Um, some of you in the audience may know, may recognize this. You know, they gather things like voltammetry. We, they immediately upload it to Julie. So it is part of our kind of, um, uh, DNA to actually do this um, and then we can as you say view it online in fact three of us just now looking at data um, three different cities two different countries you know so it does it does have that network effect we can view data very quickly this is something like over 50 um, cycle voltammograms in there and um, we can analyze the data it will by saying to Julie analyze or look for the peak in the potential range 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 volts it will find that peak it would also work if we were doing um spectroscopy as well and you said right that was wavelength and this was intensity it would also be able to find the peak um there as well um but what's really nice then is julie goes on than just analyzing peaks it it, it does the statistical analysis on lots of data and I think this is the bit where it really starts becoming a kind of more like a production tool because here you've got all these peaks and it's found all those peaks and it's able to report or tabulate that you know the peak heights what the peak heights were and I can see here that the peak heights for this set of data was 4.7 microamps the standard deviation was 0.3 microamps it doesn't have to you, you don't have to be an Einstein to realize that 0.3 divided by 4.7 is around about seven percent relative standard deviation what was the median which is 4.67 so you know, median and mean are very close which tells you something about normal distribution of the data um the minimum and the maximum um what was the smallest and what was the largest peak um so it can give you this kind of um statistical analysis on this is quite a, sm a small set of data but we do it on much larger sets of data um like this as well this is slightly repeated so i, I have this again in a minute so this is where we're actually looking at um, peak to peak um, separation and this is where we're looking at peak to peak height so we can make we can write criteria that say if this then pass if this and if not this then fail so that's how we're kind of automating our analysis I think this is not so interesting but we can look at voltammetry as a function of um, scan rate which is what academics do like to do and we can then get Julie to plot out signal versus um, scan rate um this is more typical of what we're interested in doing which is we're gathering voltammetry and we'll gather voltammetry as a function of concentration of an analyte and julie then will we'll be able to sort of say to julie look at that peak height um we'll be able to tell julie what the concentration is and then it will plot signal versus um concentration um so 
it's pretty good at making those correlations, which is something that at ZP we're particularly interested in. This is something that really features in our um, workshops, that anyone who comes to our workshops, they'll end up building a, a range of biosensors. We did one just last week um, in the USA, and there they made um, a ketone sensor and a glucose sensor. So we go through the whole story of how to make an enzymatic sensor, whether it's Gen 2, Gen, sorry, Gen 1, Gen 2, or even Gen 3. Um, but we also we gather um, data in those workshops. And so this is something that Lynn will talk about, how we essentially, are, when we test a, something like an amperometric glucose sensor, we might add in concentrations and the sensor will um, change its signal accordingly. Well, Julie, in Julie, we're actually able to automate this, um, um, let's say, sensitivity um, extraction that um, we can tell Julie what the concentrations were as a function of time, and then it will calculate for us um, what the concentrations actually are. This is um, a lot of what we do at ZP is actually we do quite a large scale gathering of um, data. I know voltammetry has come up a little bit here, but don't feel like we're limited to, um, to um, voltammetry. But here we are asking the question, um, what's my peak to peak separation? And it was saying you know, that the pass function is it should be less than 250 millivolts. Um, here it's 166 millivolts, 161, 191, 173. And therefore, those are passed. So, you know, when we're doing production, and I mean, you know, at, at sort of volume, you know, we may produce a whole row of manufactured products and we'll test at the beginning, at the middle and at the end. And, you know, rather than otherwise going through all this data quite manually, that whole template that I talked about where we can actually automate this um, is what we do. Um, and we may not just test on one feature. So one feature here, a peak, peak to peak separation. We may also test on um, the peak to peak height separation. So, you know, we want a certain intensity of signal. So here it, so it says delta Y as opposed to delta X. And we say, look, we're looking for more than peak to peak separation in the Y direction of more than six microamps. So here we can see that we've got 9.6, an 8.7, a 7.9, and we consider those passed. Um, I can, yeah, so we test on, let's say, two features. Something that I mentioned as well, which is, it'll be more significant when we do a little bit of a sense it all demo at the very end of this is API. So we have definitely built an API into Judy. We understand that most of our clients and most of the people we work with will want to have their own products. Um, and what we're really trying to do is trying to get them there as fast as possible. Um, and so by having an API in there, it means that even if somebody's using our technology stack, if they want to pull the data across to their own cloud so that they can present to their customers or their investors their own dashboard with the number that may have been otherwise collected off the Judy data stack, they can pull that number across by an API call, you know, and essentially kind of slightly hide out the fact that ZP may be involved in this um, because they can make, you know, calls upon our um, stack, bring it across to their, their cloud and then present the data um, within their own um, dashboard. Um, now, finally, what we'll do is we, we'll actually, um, we will talk about the Sensi All platform. And I said there's been a bit of a change that um, we are, you know, synonymous with electrochemistry. Um, but in fact, you know, some of our first degrees are chemistry. So we're actually quite like, we quite like spectroscopy or spectrochemical data as well. So we have been making a change to our Sensi All workflow. So even though we will, always be that kind of electrochemistry firm. We're not going to also negate the fact that there's a whole bunch of assays that work perfectly well in um, in the sort of photon. Rather than counting electrons, we can also count photons as well, though our platform for doing what I would call in vitro diagnostics or point of need testing has actually got really sophisticated at um, ZP. Um, you will see this um, this present, you will see this um, in action in real time in a bit. Um, but I wish, just want to describe the workflow to you. And there's also a webinar this week's purely dedicated to um, Sense It All as well. So I don't want to overplay it. But these days where we sit with um, the ZP technology stack is there's some sort of assay involved. It could be electrochemical. It could be spectrochemical. There's some sort of hardware involved. It could be the Sense It All um, 
electrochemical platform or hardware, or it could be the spectrochemical hardware uh, or platform. At this point, everything becomes the same because the app, you know, these apps, they make Bluetooth connection with hardware. They don't care if they're connecting to a spectrochemical system or an electrochemical system. Something that I want to say is, and I should have put a QR code into this, into this deck, is you absolutely can go on the Play Store and find an app for the Android now. So you can find the um, Sensi All app. It's in the public domain, which is a really big jump now because suddenly the whole idea that, oh, I need to make an app, which is quite trivial, is actually done. That app, you'll see when we do our, our demo today, that app talks to Julie. So that this Julie database, which are, you know I'm, I'm raving on about, it actually will is will receive data from this hardware stack as well. So what we're doing is, you know, you have a sensor um, I, or an assay, which is either electrochemical, spectrochemical. It works with the hardware. The sample has to be there. The app tells the hardware what to do. The hardware gives the data back to the app and the app sends it to Julie. You'll see them today. They have a connect and there'll be these messages that say, oh, yeah, the data went to the cloud. Where actually we process the data and send the data back to the app. The reason we do that is because we understand that in some like real products and scenarios, you actually want the data immediately processed on the app. So we can understand that. But understand in development, you really just want to make sure at least you get the raw data and you may want to make algorithm changes, especially in development. So it's so much easier to do all that algorithm stuff, let's say, up on the cloud and send the result back to the um, to the phone rather than trying to sort of burden the app. The, the app for us is a user interface and a conduit to the cloud. Actually, all the smarts take place on the cloud as well. And if you're building a business or business model, having cloud processing may be something that actually you just build into your business model anyway, because it does protect a lot of your intellectual property by doing it that way. But that's a decision for you to make and the data goes back um, here. Quick link to Sense It All. You can find out more about Sense It All on there. Now I have a, I have, a, um, I have a, um, a link here that that links me to um, a demo and I'm going to say that the first person that's going to speak today is Lynn and if Lynn's not ready that's completely fine but Lynn I want you to try and describe you know how we would do for example glucose um, data of processing. Course. Yep uh, so uh, we are normally using chrono uh, ampliometry for the data processing so I'm going to share my uh, screen for Julie. OK, so thank you, Martin, for the introduction. Um, so for uh, chrono ampliometry, we normally use them for uh, glucose and oxygen detection, which is a common technology for the sensor uh, QC. So uh, now I'm just uh, showcase a, a study that we use uh, chrono ampliometry to analyze our one of our sensor version. Uh, those sensors are the real clinical child sensor. So uh, we have uh, three, um, three of uh, each type of the sensor. One is using the uh, fresh enzyme and uh, the other two were using the old enzyme. So we are trying to see uh, how the sensor were functioning um, in different uh, enzyme coating. So this is uh, the raw uh, data we took directly from, Pong, uh, from our Anapod. So how to upload the data is uh, quite simple that uh, you just uh, need to uh, create your project by just uh, by clicking this uh, button by add a, a, a report. And then you can either drop your file or uh, click on this add button to add your file into this box. Afterwards, uh, you will you will go to uh, the properties. So in here, you also have a chance to change your file name. For example, if you want to have a, a better name for the reporting purpose and a better format, you can add it here. Um, and uh, the next step you would need to do is uh, to uh, make sure the, the software knows you want to analyze uh, uh, chrono and prometry because uh, this uh, you are able to to upload multiple files. So uh, with uh, different files, you might apply different technology. So you need to tell the tell the software what you are analyzing. So in here, I'm analyzing continuous uh, study, and uh, uh, what I'm applying is the metric method. So uh, I just uh, select here; it's uh, pre-selected for me. 
Um, also, uh, you could uh, also tell it what you are studying because uh, sometimes you are not uh, studying the concentration as a function of signal. You might be using percentage or um, the, the wavelengths or uh, something like that. So um, the next step is uh, to once you uh, open, click this one, uh, the AC tab will appear on your toolbox. Um, what you need to do is uh, to um, it's uh, already like a preset for you for the status and the access on the status. You can you can choose like a, a what scans you want from the status. But uh, in this study, we only have a one scan. Um, on the axis, uh, you also can play with that uh, by uh, analyzing the log rhythmic uh, correlation between the X and Y. By here, we are doing the transitional study. Uh, the baseline is an interesting one because uh, on the baseline, uh, what happened here is uh, if you see the baseline before we spiking any glucose concentration, we, we saw there's uh, some offset in the baseline. Uh, of course, uh, we can put on more study into understand why the baseline is here, but uh, to ensure we we have a fair visualized uh, comparison uh, in your curve, we normally bring the the baseline uh, down to zero. So uh, the way I uh, we did it here is uh, that we select the baseline, um, and there are like other other functions you can do deal with uh, pre processing like uh, to remove the noise. But here we are doing the baseline correction. To filter the base die, uh, you have options to either do the offset, which is the simplest way, or linear or quadratic. So it's depending on your data set, uh, you could choose a uh, different ways accordingly. So for the offset, is uh, simply by bring um, the 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 your signal window in between 250 to 290, which is a uh, uh, is uh, up to you how you select it according to your data. But normally we have a, a standard protocol how to run the experiment. So we know um, at 300 seconds is our first uh, spiking time uh, of a two uh, min molar, and then we do another spike at 400 uh, seconds. So uh, I normally select the baseline between 250 to 290. And uh, uh, once I apply this uh, baseline setting, all this curve will be brought to zero so that we can have a better comparison uh, in this uh, data. The next step is uh, to um, to fit our uh, step because uh, uh, in here we are doing stepwise um, experiment and uh, we tell the software that uh, where we did a spike and how much. So what you do here is uh, to click the configure events so in here, uh, you can uh, add another tab uh, to tell the software like uh, what is your next step. But as I mentioned uh, earlier that we did uh, the step uh, every 100 seconds after the, the first uh, 300 seconds equivalent time. So uh, I just add another step here just uh, to showcase um, we how we add another step. So in here, I'm just uh, telling the software uh, where I want to analyze my um, my stepwise signal and uh, how much is the concentration when I was uh, selecting this uh, this this uh, um, current at uh, this current range. And uh, the next step is uh, uh, once I finish, I just uh, simply close uh, down. And uh, don't forget that we need to extract the the value so that you can have a more in depth analysis report. So we, we normally need to show uh, extracted value, statistical evaluation, and independent evaluation, which is uh, reflected in the graph here. So after you close the window, after selecting all the setup in the tab, um, those uh, uh, analysis will be shown up. So uh, the first one is uh, the traditional uh, linear regression. So what you will see here is a, a plot of uh, all sensors um, signal versus its concentration, which is uh, uh, commonly what we normally see in our um, chronoanthropometry analysis. Uh, in this graph is uh, telling us our LOD. So if you place your cursor here, it will tell you what, it, what your LOD is. Um, is a uh, uh, two uh, min molar for this data set, maybe may, mainly because uh, we have a scattering data. So this will give you a really uh, 
detailed information on how your data set would look like and also supported by the independent analysis. Each sensor was analyzed by its R squared uh, deviation from the curve and also its uh, independent LOD uh, LOQ information. Uh, if we want to have like a further information uh, on the sensor to sensor performance, we also have a statistic um, analysis on each concentration across all the sensors. So we have a histogram plot as well as uh, the winding plot. So you can, it's a similar to a box plot, but it will be more visual on where our median is and uh, where our upper and low, lower limit is. So um, normally we uh, use uh, this uh, information uh, for uh, FDA purpose. And also uh, you, if you want to get the analysis data, you can either export it as a PDF you, you will have a choice to uh, show the signature in your report and uh, or or not. So this this one, uh, you just need to select to be A4 printing uh, and export it to save in your um, file, or you can just download the analysis results to do further analysis on top of uh, Julie what Julie supplies. Yeah, so this is uh, the chrono amperometry. Thank you. And I saw Lynn, and, and you were kind enough to message me that you may do voltammetry as well. Is that correct? Exactly. OK, brilliant. Thanks so much. OK, so uh, the next one is um, uh, the chrono amperometry. Um, with the chrono amperometry, uh, it's a different method to um, cycle. Uh, sorry, the, the next method is a cyclovoltammetry. Cyclovoltammetry is well, I have to different. add at this point, Lynn has a PhD in electrochemistry, so and so the, <laughs> there's some cross wire here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, we are doing the cycle uh, um, So this is uh, very different from uh, chrono amperometry. Chrono amperometry is uh, a measurement of uh, uh, current at a fixed uh, potential uh, and is, um, is uh, recorded in a period of time. But cyclovoltammetry, otherwise, is a uh, is a uh, by its name is uh, like a cycling up and down uh, at the uh, uh, potential range, and uh, the current is uh, recorded uh, uh, accordingly. The most classic equation to characterize uh, cyclovoltammetry is a randall shevick equation, which is uh, given uh, by a, a long equation uh, here, which is a, a characteristic of um, the diffusion coefficient of uh, the analyte and uh, the concentration as well as the uh, electro uh, area. So this equation is uh, particularly useful for um, majority uh, of the data analysis because uh, you can either like known the the other two and then deduce uh, the third one or vice versa. Um, so uh, this is a study we are using the classic uh, ferrocyanide, uh, fer ferry ferrocyanide uh, with uh, three different concentration and uh, we are we are showcasing you how the cyclovoltammetry is like and how Julie can extract the peak height because uh, the Randall Sheff equation is uh, depending on the peak height. Um, so the um, potential range we are uh, selecting here is uh, within the uh, ferry ferrocyanide redox potential, which is uh, between minus 0 0.2 to plus uh, 0 0.5, but this is uh, depending on your reference electro. And the scan rate here is uh, 500 millimolar, and we did it twice because uh, sometimes uh, on the first scan, you didn't have a stable uh, scan. Um, also, the other... Uh, yeah, so the other thing with uh, um, the sensor is that like uh, always uh, remember to record uh, the batch so that you know what you are uh, analyzing. So uh, it's the same as a uh, chrono amperometry that we are uh, uploading um, a file from a uh, peer session. And then uh, this time, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that we need to let the equipment know what study we are trying to do. So this uh, uh, cyclovoltammetry we are doing is uh, on the discrete uh, analysis because uh, as uh, the name su um, suggested, the chrono amperometry is a uh, continuous because uh, the is um, in the continuous uh, serious time. But uh, with the cyclovoltammetry, you just uh, do it at, at one go and then you wait for another an, another one to go for. So it's another like a uh, feature rich um, technique we 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 commonly use to characterize the electrode and. Uh, is uh, categorized as a discrete uh, analysis. Uh, 
So after you select a voltometry, um, voltometry tab, uh, the, the VD appears. Um, and uh, the status and the axis is uh, the same as uh, I mentioned earlier, you can uh, feel free to play with. Um, if you want to do the pre-processing by reset the baseline, you can, but uh, you don't normally suggest to because the uh, cyclovoltometry, you need to leave the baseline as it is for the peak uh, extraction. Um, here, uh, because uh, I want to showcase uh, the uh, Randall shaft equation to understand where my peak high is. So uh, I will select the peak high fit. So in the peak high fit, uh, we we normally uh, do deal with the forward peak, but Julie also can help you to do the backward peak. But the random shelving equation mainly cover for the forward peak, uh, because well, for the uh, reversible uh, study. So what we did here is uh, we uh, just uh, need to select window. So uh, as I um, uh, as uh, this uh, indicated that like uh, we we know that uh, the peak roughly, you just need to have a rough idea where the, the peak is uh, located. So um, because uh, in these uh, three different concentrations, the peak has a slight, a slight shifting uh, in the window, but um, I know that like it should be in the centered in the 0.3 uh, in average, and uh, and then I need to spend the window a little bit, so I need to do plus or minus uh, 0.1 so that I can cover the full window to extract the peak. So in here, uh, it's uh, as simple as uh, to click uh, the peak fit and then to tell the window. If you want to do the reverse peak, you need to select a different window. For example, this peak appears at zero. You might need to do zero uh, and the plus or minus 0.1 and uh, click the reverse and the valley so that you can see the reverse peak. Um, not to complicate the matters, I just uh, show you how the peak is uh, extracted. So after um, after selecting it, it will tell you where the peaks are. So this is automatically selected by Julie that showing us uh, this is the peak location of uh, these uh, three peaks. Um, and uh, also uh, this uh, also forms um, a linear regression showing us uh, uh, the correlation on the peak versus uh, the, um, the concentration. But also because uh, we mentioned about the Randall shelf equation, what, what else you can also do is uh, uh, if you know the surface area of the electro and also the concentration, you can deduce the diffusion coefficient or you know the diffusion coefficient, you can see whether your concentration fits well with uh, what we put in. So those are the college check we can uh, do for um, for the screen uh, printed electrodes uh, and uh, also uh, to under to to use in academia for study and also like uh, recently there are some uh, publications are using cyclovoltometry as a, a normal applied uh, analysis method. So that is uh, the um, demo for the cyclovoltometry. So Mati. Well, yeah, I appreciate it, Lynn. Thanks very much. Thank and, that, and thank, thank you for um, for coming in and doing the cycle of altimetry. Um, I, well, I just give a quick running of order. Next, we're going to have Tatiana talking about um, impedance spectroscopy. Everyone loves a bit of impedance spectroscopy, so Tatiana will um, be giving that. Um, and then when Tatiana's finished, I'll give a quick introduction for Guyana, and then Guyana will talk about um, the Sensi All platform. So thanks, Tatiana. I'll just turn my um, my camera off now. Yes, uh, here we are. So I would like to talk a bit on electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. This, this is a technique that we use quite a lot at ZP. We use it uh, very often when we need to characterize our sensor during the fabrication as electrochemical impedance allow us to see a difference in uh, resistance and capacitance. We also uh, use it a lot when it comes to the immunosensor, and uh, we need to uh, characterize the analytes or biomolecules in the solution. But here, uh, here's the report that includes the data from a bare sensor tested in different uh, concentration of sulfide in it. And if you go to the actual data plot, here's uh, something called border plot. This is a magnitude versus frequency. And this is the next one is also border plot. It's phase versus frequency. 
Here's, uh, we have concentration from zero, uh, zero milligram per liter up to 80 milligram per liter, and we tested it um, for frequency from 0.1 hertz to 100 kilohertz. Each data here, each data point is represented as a point here, as a dot, and we have a solid line, which is uh, basically our equivalent circuit fitting that I will talk uh, in a second. And we also have a different representation of our data. We can look at uh, data as uh, imaginary impedance versus real impedance. It's just the uh, same representation, sort of, but in a different plane. So if we go to the equivalent circuit, uh, Julie is capable of fitting your data into the circuit, equivalent circuit. Here's the most popular, most often used uh, uh, circuit. Basically, it's composed of R0, which is uh, often referred to the solution impedance. We also have R1, which is charge transfer resistance, and Warburg element, which is responsible, they're both together responsible for the diffusion uh, effects in our solution. And we also have C2, which is a double layer capacitance. If we look on the right here, we have our parameter plot where we have predicted sulfide uh, concentration versus actual sulfide concentration for each component in this circuit. So if I go, for example, to R2, which is solution resistance, we can see that uh, the predicted values doesn't really match the actual values. It's just uh, overall around 100. Uh, uh, value of 100, which basically makes sense because solution resistance is more or less stable across different uh, analyte concentration. But if, for example, we have a look at the Warburg element, here we have a nice trend, and uh, basically the limit of detection is around 20 milligram per liter. It can be easily seen here. Uh, in below, we also have a table which gives a bit more details on each element, uh, R square value of how well this element corresponds to the concentration. And we also have a limit of detection. And again, for Warburg, it says 28 milligram per liter. And I would like to also say that we have an option to change the circuit parameter if you want, if you need to have a different circuit, equivalent circuit, you can always go to the edit mode, tools, properties, impedance discrete and just slide down and you will see there is a circuit configuration here. Uh, hyphen stands for the serial connection and bracket stands for the parallel connection. And also what Julie does uh, for you is basically it's, uh, you don't need to give initial guess in some, as in some other applications. Julie does the guessing for yourself, but if you'd like to play with it a bit, you can always change those parameters in here. So if I go back to the equivalent circuit, uh, here is a bit more data, statistical data on those parameters. If you'd like to see, there is uh, mean values and standard deviation for each of the components. And you also have a chi-square, which basically says how well your model fitted into the circuit. And uh, yes, of course, this equivalent circuit is a very good method to, to find the um, calibration curve for the analyte, but you can always use just a standard approach when you take, uh, basically, you choose the range of magnitude where you want to characterize your analyte for different concentrations. And within this range, you basically can plot your calibration curve. So here it's done for magnitude in low frequency range, and it gives quite nice R square value of 0.992. And here it's done for the phase, it also works, but with a bit uh, lower, uh, a bit worse uh, R square value. And if you just compare it to the Warburg element, for example, uh, Warburg was given 0.936, so it was slightly worse in the in this uh, terms in the calibration curve. So you can, it's up to you what you would like to choose. But Julie offers both methods. You can uh, see what works the best in uh, your sensor. So, yes, Martin, that's all, I guess. All right, brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Tatiana. Um, I know it's it, it, it's very hard to um, to get um, impedance spectroscopy understood within um, three minutes, but we, we appreciate that that the technology can definitely do it. So um, if you want to turn your camera off, I'm just going to share the screen for a second because I, I am going to have a um, a final colleague um, called Guyana coming in in, um, in a bit. But because we have a certain guest this afternoon, um, I just wanted to kind of highlight something that is changing at ZP. Um, 
a lot of this data now where um, we're always the biggest users of our own technology. So we're the biggest users of Julie. We're the biggest users of our screen printed electrodes. And lo and behold, what is this? This is a um, ZP potential stat built by many of the engineers that are actually around the, um, the table this afternoon. Um, and it's a system for doing parallel um, testing. It's a, essentially a potential stat. It's got a slightly different emphasis on, on the potential stats that you're kind of used to because it's not trying to be the data processing engine. The data processing engine is, is Julie, but it is the data capture engine. So um, I think it's one of the smallest multi-channel potential stats around. It's got a nice little touch screen on it. And again, what's nice about the technologies that we do at ZP is that we, we've we already tested these things quite a few times before they get into the real world. Um, so that's just to kind of say that we do have this parallel um, potential stat um, coming as well. And, um, going to make a real difference to I think the world of sensor development because I think the biggest thing that happens in sensor development that's a bit wrong is people are not doing parallel testing so you've seen that actually we do a lot of parallel testing um, and even the, the first potential stat that we'll put on the market is already set up to be parallel that's a six channel instrument what I want to say is um, I'm going to um, my colleague Guyana is going to come on she's going to do a quick demonstration of something called sense it all this is another conduit for data um, into um, another conduit of data into um, Julie as well. So again, if you want to come on, I will um, stop sharing and also turn off my um, camera as well. Cool, that's a good shot of you, Gana. Oh, um, hello everyone, I'm Gana. I'm an engineer here in Simon Peacock. I'll demonstrate this install platform today. So this install platform consists of the uh, device and the mobile app. Uh, which is running on both Android and iOS systems. And uh, once uh, the device is running the measurement, the set of data is sent to the June, where the data is getting analyzed and we can see the results on the mobile screen itself. Now I'll just uh, quickly show the device. So here is our, the new uh, version of the device. It has a uh, LED indicator, which, uh, which shows the state of the device. Uh, it also has a power button. And um, I also have the mobile app with me. Uh, so the first thing that I need to do is to scan the QR code. Uh, for, I'll just scan the... So now I scan the QR code, which is for uh, ginger sensors. And then the mobile phone understood that we are going to measure uh, the ginger. Uh, concentration inside the solution and the set up the mobile app uh, for, for that. And now I can connect to the device by clicking to the Bluetooth icon. Now it's searching for available devices. And now uh, I see that since tall 1033 is available. I just click on it to connect. Yeah, now, now the device is connected. Uh, the next step that we need to do, we can uh, have uh, some test settings. I can click to the card and then set up the sample, uh, sample ID. I have this uh, ginger solution with me that we will need to test. So I'll just write the sample ID as uh, ginger, uh, ginger test. And the cluster name, I'll just write demo. So these two settings are, um, we're setting these two uh, names to be able to find the data inside the Julie, which I will show in the end of this demonstration. Uh, now everything is ready. I'll just click go to assay. And uh, for this version of the Sensito app, of Sensito device, we have cartridges, which consist of the sensor. And all I need to do is to put the cartridge inside the device and click it up to connect the sensor to the connectors, which are on the top part of the device. Yeah, and now I'll pipe at 50 microliter of solution. And I'll be careful to not scratch the electrodes. And also I'll make sure that I'm covering all the electrodes with the solution. Uh, so this solution has one to ten uh, 
quantitative uh, uh, dilution factor, it means that it has one part of the uh, sample and a nine part of the uh, ginger pot uh, buffer. So I don't need to change anything uh, here. I'll just click on that and then start the measurement. Uh, right now, the device is running cyclic world of autometry, which is the uh, electrochemical uh, measurement method which we are using for, to detect gingerol inside the solution. And once the uh, measurement is done, uh, the device will send the data to the jury, where it will get analyzed. And after uh, approximately uh, seven seconds, we will see the results on the screen. Yeah, uh, now you can see the results. It shows the concentration with uh, micromolar and also uh, gram per milligrams per liter. Uh, also, we see that upload is completed. Uh, that means that we can find the, uh, the data inside the, inside the jewelry. And also the device uh, turned uh, green, which also indicates for successful, successful measurement. Um, now I'll go to Julie. I will need to log in. And then I'll search demo as a cluster name. Choose the device. And then I see the data ginger test. I'll click on that. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is the voltammogram of the measurement that we just run. And on the bottom, we will see the uh, analysis part, and we will see that we are using uh, um, peak heights and uh, some uh, um, areas under the peaks to uh, detect the concentration. So thank and you for that, Ganna, yes, I could, okay. Thank you so much, because I know we've got another demo this week on Sensit All, so we'll we'll save we'll save the the, the flicking to the other assay um, for for those um, for that for that demo as well. Um, so I, I kind of got a big thank you here, but I realized that there was something I actually wanted to sh um, just share just at the end here. So let me just um, very quickly um, try and navigate back to what I was trying to share. Yeah, so let me just share this. In fact, I've shared it already. So let me just say a, um, a quick thank you for attending our webinar. We appreciate you. Um, you've come in, come in very late from where you are in the world, so um, it's appreciated. But I hope it was nice that you get a sense of ZP. We have a Quite, you know, a strong technology stack. There's a strong data sciences team here. Obviously, we understand our electrochemistry. We've um, diversified into into spectroscopy data, and also, you know, this kind of statement that sample to cloud is a real thing. Let's say, and Ghana said, "Oh, it'll be about seven seconds," but in fact, that data went to the cloud and back again. So it felt like real time, and obviously, that's a in part that's thanks to the network in 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 norway we understand in different parts of the world that could be a slightly different matter but in the end the whole world is going to be completely connected so i want to say thank you so much to our guest i want to say thank you so much to the zp team um and i do wish you all a good day and a good evening okay thanks very much take care thank you